Hi, welcome back to another episode of Spit or Swallow Pod with your favorite host, House of Chocolate. Yay! <laughs> Today is a special day as per usual, and with me, I have a very special guest, Anu. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Today, we're talking about something really serious. I've, I've said it, I think, in episode season one and two where we're running away from the heavier topics but um i have anu with me to discuss um trauma we're talking about sexual trauma today and so trigger warning if you know that um the topic is is too heavy for you feel free to you know close it but you should listen um just take care of yourself as we discuss this very important and prevalent issue in our country but um before we get into the heaviness, we're going to play a little game. But Anu, um, introduce yourself. Tell everyone what you do, how you got into what you do as well. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I am a clinical psychologist and I work as the lead psychotherapist at Us Therapy. It is a mental health platform that provides um, psychotherapy services and re- research and education just like to make mental health information accessible to people. And I work with people across all gender, sexuality, across the board. I got into the field mostly um, based off of workplace burnout. I saw, I, before I started practicing as a clinical psychologist full-time, I worked in marketing and I saw people experience the start-up burnout where they walk into my office and they'll break down crying mm. and so on. And that combined with some, unfortunately, terrible experiences that people had within the mental health space where they were exposed to over-religious therapists mm. and like some homophobia and so on. And it was like, this is not what they taught me in school. Mm-hmm. Let's see what we can do differently. So I started working at the Initiative for Equal Rights and I was practicing there as a um, clinical psychologist there. And I got exposed to like advocacy work um, and people just across boards, just like working with them hand in hand really sensitized me to information that might not even be taught in school, especially from a sexuality and gender standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then after that, after about two years, I started us therapy and I've been working there full time with the information from tears everywhere Sha, and it's been a ride since Aww, then. amazing and that actually sounds really similar to um you know my journey and being in the financial industry and but the burnouts that made me leave was my own personal burnouts you know i was just just done honestly and also feeling misaligned with like what i was doing knowing that i could you know do better but then even in the sexuality space i think that is something that it wasn't something i thought i needed to do but it's one of those ones where you know you're having conversations and you see the gap and then you know I was, when i was thinking about therapy i'm like especially when it comes to sex there's no you really find single people lgbtq friendly um sex therapists in nigeria you even find that a lot of people have like marriage counselors so from yeah. marriage counseling you've already excluded like a lot of people because mm-hmm. not everybody's interested in marriage and even then those ones don't even go deep into sex itself and then you also don't have anyone you don't have sexuality professionals too you have everybody who has a very like binary standard approach they bring their own religious nature into as a man as a woman is Mm -hmm, your duty you should mm -hmm. always have sex when your husband wants you know all of that stuff so i mean it's very amazing that you know you're in um this space i'm very happy that you're here so before we get into a spit or swallow oh (laughs) spit spit why spit uh, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so I'm going to play a little game just to soften things a bit before we get into the meat of the conversation. Pick three cards. Um. Okay. Are you open to BDSM? Yes. What kind of BDSM? Ah, <laughs> primary school level. <laughs> <laughs> which of the in the B, the D, the S, and the M? Which one is which one are you more aligned with? S. S. Okay. Okay. Not bad. As this is very well called the relation. Tell me your love language. I mean, I guess you can talk about it. Gifts. Gifts. Yes. Okay. Any potential annual lovers? <laughs> yeah. Just told you. And tell me one thing people would never guess about you. I don't like pepper. You don't like pepper. 
<laughs> that is such a random thing. Why don't you like pepper? I'm just allergic to it. Oh, fair. So whether it's pepper in the show me pepper side or pepper like Any actual pepper. I don't want pepper. You don't want pepper. I don't want pepper. You, don't want you, pepper. you love pepper over here. <laughs> Okay, now let's get into it. So we're talking about um, trauma, sexual trauma. And, you know, let's start from, I feel like trauma is one word that you cannot even scroll two seconds in time without seeing trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that, um, obviously, in this age of internet speak, some things are being watered down. I love that people are becoming more conscious Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're learning on the internet. But right now, there's almost nothing you can see where in the comments, you say, you're going to give that child trauma, you're going to cause trauma, da, 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 da. So what would you describe or what would you um, define as trauma? I think, um, if I will simplify it, like trauma is the impact that an event leaves on the individual. Mm-hmm. If you're going to look at it from the medical standpoint, and I'm talking solely from my school of Grey's Anatomy background Mm -hmm. you'll say blunt force trauma to the head or whatever because like something has hit them and then like their body's responding to that so from an emotional psychological standpoint um when you experience any sort of distressing event it might not be traumatic if it doesn't leave that impact on you so two Mm -hmm. people can experience the same event and react differently it is the impact that it has on the person that now determines whether it's traumatic or Or not not. yeah and so um what would you? How long would you say is typically the effect of a traumatic event? Um, there are different kinds. There's like the acute trauma where immediately you're you're having that response um to the event. So acute trauma is like the immediate um impact, the immediate response you have to the situation. So for example, if someone experiences say a plane crash right they might be catatonic they might be rigid they might not be able to speak for a while or they might find them screaming that is like the immediate response to the situation but like about two weeks to six months after that you might still experience like chronic trauma where your body is responding in certain ways you're having flashbacks you're having nightmares you're having forgetfulness you're experiencing difficulty being present in the situation and then there's like the complex ptsd where you might have experienced something significant as a kid to your adolescence but it's still playing a huge role in your life and it has played a significant role over time that you might not be able to name like this is the one thing that happened but because it happened across board over time it's still playing a role now so there are different um time and i think of say acute chronic like complex those are the ways i would like Mm -hmm. look at it Mm -hmm. and so in now what would you define as sexual trauma I I love it. Sexual trauma is very complicated, very nuanced in the sense that um, a client can walk into a situation and not be able to name what they have experienced as sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. And it is not my job to say like, what you have experienced sexual trauma until they are able to say like, okay, this was traumatic to me, Mm -hmm. right? Like I said, people can experience the The same same thing thing. and experience and still have a different response to it, even though like Mm -hmm. the behavior to them was like horrible. So there is the activity-based definition where a client can say like, oh, this person penetrated me without my consent. This person touched me in certain ways. Therefore, I understand that it is traumatic to me. Mm -hmm. But then there's non-penetrative sexual trauma. There's non-penetrative assault and so on that happens that they might not be able to like name it. So I think I would say like sexual trauma are like the responses that you have to like violence against your body or an intrusion against yeah. your body where you are not like a willing enthusiastic participant mm-hmm. there or like an informed willing and enthusiastic participant there yeah yeah i mean i feel like that fully encompasses it because i find that a lot of times people will be giving you gist and they'll be saying oh yeah you know this happened this happened this happened but you realize that they're describing like rape they're describing situations where they were not consenting Mm -hmm. and a lot of it even boils down to that autonomy and boils down to people not even understanding the concept of consent Mm -hmm. you also find a lot of women don't realize that you know my body my choice my body my rights they don't understand that especially people in relationships Mm -hmm. you know up till now up till tomorrow some people fight against marital rape they'll tell you there's no such thing as marital rape but they don't understand that as long as you are not willingly participating in mm-hmm. that um mm-hmm. 
whatever happened, that sexual activity, you can have a traumatic response to it. Your body does not like it. And then you also find people who, it's like you said, there's not everyone who can name how mm-hmm. they feel, but they mm-hmm. know that, you know, I walked away from this feeling um, some type of way. And so, yes, I, like, like I definitely agree that it can be really complex. And, you know, that's why therapy is also important because you sometimes dialing back into childhood and people's previous experiences and how they even became the sexual person that they are in terms of what they like, what they have aversions to ETC can come from, you know, their earlier um, experiences. What would you say um, you've typically seen as something that presents for clients that you that you come in that come in due to like sexual trauma what are typical um symptoms that you see or are there things that you can pick where you know this behavior was likely because they had sexual trauma but they haven't really tied like hmm i mean there's the there's the one where there might be like relational um issues where the clients can say categorically that this partner that I'm with now is great. I'm attracted to this person. I want to be sexual with this person. And mentally, I'm there. But like when sexual um, activities are initiated, my body shuts down to it, right? And I think that when there's that disconnect between like the mind and the body, then we can start asking questions around that. A lot of time, there's also a high level of dissociation when um, sexual activity occurs, where they just find themselves like it's like they're watching they're watching themselves have sex with this person because mm. like they don't feel safe enough to stay in their, in their body, body. Mm. while it's happening because like the one of the earliest introductions that they had to the event was um, distressing to them, and then it might also be a thing where their relationships with different stages of sex is is distorted. For example, earlier you mentioned that some people may leave may not know what they're experiencing, but they know that they left a place not liking what they what they experienced. But some people might be sexually assaulted and orgasm from this situation, mm-hmm. right? Some people might leave it might have might be may, might have been assaulted but like their body was wet mm-hmm. they had the typical biological responses Response, yeah. to it and if you're with your partner now that you still feel safe with or maybe you don't feel safe yet with because of your relationship with sex and you're still wet mm-hmm. and you're still orgasming and you're still having all of these things your relationship to that is not my body is experiencing a pleasurable activity yeah. it is my body has experienced this before and that was not okay and yeah. this is happening again. again so it's just so distorted and they might just be like, I don't know why I'm experiencing this and I don't know why I can't, you know, look forward yeah, to I'm it. Yeah, orgasming, but still, I'm not happy. I'm not Something happy. Something is yes, wrong. I don't something. feel connected. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So they might feel, um, they might be, what's the word now? I don't want to call it like disgusted, but like in a situation where like they would just immediately want to stand up and leave and, and clean their body yeah. and just like, yeah. you know, get it off of them because like it's not something that they want to stay and chill and yeah. perform aftercare. Yeah, because they don't, so they on. associate orgasming, being wet with that traumatic mm-hmm. experience where mm-hmm. someone has violated them. Mm-hmm. And so each time they have that reaction, it's like, oh yeah, my orgasm is supposed to be something good. So I know someone who has even asked me to speak about orgasm anxiety Mm -hmm. and they told me that it was because the time they actually got violated the orgasm and so when they want to when they have sex with people that they love they don't want to orgasm Mm -hmm. because it takes them back to that you know situation that happened before exactly and the way um sexual assault happens there's like traumatic sexualization where it's not like they slammed you to the wall people in Tyler Perry movies and all of this, they'll slam you to the wall and then all of this but sometimes you're seduced into it mm-hmm. they're like i will give you sweet i will give you one key mm-hmm. i will give you all of these things and yeah. it's like it now feels like you played a role mm-hmm. in the assault. So yeah. you don't know that this was an assaulting, you know, situation. Yeah. And then you now feel betrayed by yourself mm-hmm. and by your body that, mm-hmm. oh my you God, I can't believe me. I participated yeah. in that. And then there's now, you're now stigmatizing yourself mm-hmm. and you're like calling yourself all sorts of names. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like all of this is happening in the background. And then, you know, your mates, your friends, people are talking about like, oh my God, I can't wait. This person was so this, And you're just like, 
no, I don't. And there's also that level of powerlessness that shows up in your relationship with people, your relationship with consent. Mm -hmm. It's very foreign to be able to say no. You don't know the difference between willingness, enthusiastic, and like, Mm -hmm. no, like I'm not doing anymore. So those are the things that like show up in sessions where when they start talking about it, then I now start asking questions like, is this something that you're okay with? Should we explore it? And then we might now walk our way to yes i was assaulted you know because it's not always a penetrative thing like it was super violent mm-hmm. sometimes it's very like benign and it's just like this happened even stealthy for mm-hmm. instance some mm-hmm. people might not even know that yes the violence happened and there's something that you're uncomfortable with but like yeah yeah so those are yes and you know you have a lot of people who also it, it's also the um being being violated in terms of the type of sexual activity they were okay with Mm -hmm. they were okay with maybe first second third base so like making out kissing even head but they just didn't want penetration Penetration, and then obviously the person thought oh if you're okay with this we might as well do this and then it can even be either them penetrating you just really quickly so it may not be violent but it was like okay we're already doing that and then you have people who just freeze and just give in because but then obviously you know that you go out of that experience feeling like I really didn't want that yes I was enjoying everything else but Mm -hmm. it's just that one thing and I find a lot of people and it's not even just women a lot of people they don't count um and I would say women more because women do experience more um like assault Mm -hmm. and all that stuff where it's not every time um someone violates you or assaults you that you would count it because if you want to count every single experience you've had where someone has done something to your body that you didn't want you just be you just be in a consistent in a constant state of just distress and trauma and yeah. hypervigilance you know and so I, I find that um like you said it's not every time people want to even name it they mm-hmm. know deep down inside but they've suppressed it because it's like you know what i'm just going to shake it off it's okay yes. actually maybe i even wanted it maybe i even enjoyed it and all but the thing about about the body and consciousness is it stays somewhere mm-hmm. as long as you're lying to yourself in any way it's going to be in some parts of your consciousness and it usually shows up in subsequent you know sexual experiences yeah. so um yeah, this I mean it's really loaded because you find that there's so many almost everyone has and I would say even men too because I find that a lot of women you know women we're always talking about consent this and that but a lot of women don't also respect the autonomy of men mm-hmm. and I, I feel like it comes with a lot of sexualization and assuming Absolutely. that men are also always um ready for sex and you know there was even a time it was a run joke on the internet when they would ask ladies oh if if you ask a man for sex and he says no what are you going to do and all of them are like oh what is no I'll just start sucking it I'll just start doing this I'll just start and it's like, nah, you're actually also mm-hmm. violating. You're also being a rapist. It's, it's just because I think a lot of people associate rape with violence and they think eh, a woman cannot overpower a man. But it's like, if someone is sleeping or, you know, you come back and you're drunk and you just jump on him, like, you have to also give the grace and the respect that you expect someone to give your own body to your partners and you know this is me talking to women as well it's like if a man says no the no is no don't just go around grabbing people's dicks or you know Mm -hmm. all of that stuff Mm -hmm. so yeah i think um everyone just needs to be more respectful of other people's bodies and choices and no matter what how deep you are in what you're doing because you find that people feel like hey if i say penetrating and she says she doesn't want to i've i'm too far gone it's like no like i don't care if you have one second away from coming like you don't stop it like yeah. pull out use your hands to finish yourself up. everybody wants to act like oh i'm so helpless i can't control myself but honestly i find that it's really a lie um yeah so i'm going to jump into the sexuality bit and you know dealing with queer clients in nigeria how has that been and you know how has been you know navigating the differences between obviously the typical binary form of you know dealing with um clients with like queer people how's that been i think that at the beginning um there was a lot of there was a huge need to emphasize like the safety of the space because Nigeria is not an affirming country. It's not a welcoming country. And there were, you find that when clients are coming in and they're talking about their partners, there's like this pronoun. They, 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 they. You know? <laughs> and they're like dodging and everything. And I'm just like, okay, let's rewind from the beginning. My name is Anu. I'm an affirming uh, LGBT therapist. 
this is 1000% a safe space. This is what you're entitled to as a client, regardless of your sexuality. You're entitled to unconditional positive regard. You're, you're entitled to a non judgmental space. And you're entitled to like 1000% confidentiality as far you can sue me if I do anything that exposes you mm-hmm. or any of the information that you share here. And it's like, you're right. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So when she said, and I'm like, come on now, let's get started. Exactly. You I know? love that. And that's emphasis on like safety over and over again. It's, it was so important. And the more that happened, the more I got to learn um, how religion plays a role in the expression of, you know, queerness. Mm-hmm. how for example even this conversation on like sexual assault it also happens a lot within the queer space mm-hmm. and when conversations like this are happening on twitter there is like this um heterosexual point of view that yes. happens they don't really understand that women can also assault other women yeah. you know the the role that age difference plays in it the role mm-hmm. that power plays in it mm-hmm. and also the role that you know living in a country like nigeria plays in the prevalence of sexual assault because when it happens between a man and a woman he might not they might not take it all the way to court but at least you know that so you can say with yourself so I went to the police yeah. but when you're queer you How can't you really have that yeah. exactly you don't From really have shame. that institutional mm-hmm. um, backing mm-hmm. so and that like amplifies it because it's like where do I where, where do I go and mm-hmm. if your partner is also your family mm-hmm. and you've not yet built that found family in terms of friendships yeah. outside of the romantic relationships mm-hmm. it can create a very very tricky situation yeah, yeah. as well. And yeah. then there's also the role that finances play in, in all of these because like for a lot of people have been thrown out of their houses mm-hmm. because of their sexuality. Yeah. And it's like, oh, should I come out and proud and tell them myself as consequence, or should I just like borrow and finish university mm-hmm. and get a job? Mm-hmm. And what is the mental health cost of, you know, being closeted versus the financial cost yeah. of being out there? And for people that don't even have all of this, you know, food, clothes, shelter needs, there's also the... uh, the, Societal cost. There's also the societal cost, you know. There's the, am I actually queer? Am I actually bi? What is the, am I an asexual person? Am Mm. I a trans person? Like, and then learning the language around all of these experiences Mm. that they have. Because sometimes it just feels like a lot of these terms are thrown at them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what what role did compulsory heterosexuality Mm -hmm. play in my identification I'm 50 years old can I yeah. come out now as yeah. a lesbian and so on so it's just very nuanced but it's always a joy to work with clients like that and just be like okay well you're here now let's get started, let's get started. Yeah. yeah I think and I think that is, is is very important because even for me more so as a sexuality professional where I have to be abreast of you know all of these terms and you know I, I have conversations with people where they're saying mm, which one is this one now which one is heteroromantic which one is great ace which one is this which one is that? and I'm just like you have to give people the grace to be identified how they fit best. Mm-hmm. But also, also something you learn is that you don't also want to be... Because sometimes you're working on eggshells. You don't want them to recline. You don't want mm-hmm. to be throwing those terms. Yes. You can also be overwhelming, overwhelming them because they also don't even know what it means. Sure. They don't there's some people who haven't labeled themselves. They just know what they they just know what their behavior is. Sure. They know what who or what they're attracted to. And so working together to be like, okay, well, do you identify more with this, this, this? And also the fact that it can be fluid just because you started here. It doesn't mean that, you know, you need to end here. And, you know, dialing back to like the societal ramifications as well, you find that even people from privileged or affluent homes, like that's why in Nigeria, you know, you find a lot of people using women as beards, even women doing the same thing. I know, I mean, I'm okay with, I know there are some people who you have like a lesbian and a gay guy, they just tag team and marry each other for peace. Then they do, you know, what they want. And I guess for them, that's the best way they feel like they can survive in this environment. But obviously it would be nicer if everyone could, you know, be who they want to be. And that's why the conversation can be really dicey because you have people who are judging people. I, I think for me, my own is where when dishonesty becomes a thing, because if you're going to be with a partner and they don't know your true sexuality and then you're pretending just for the sake and then they find out, of course, that can be very damaging and traumatizing to them. Mm-hmm. And I think because lesbianism is not taking... The homophobia towards lesbianism is way less than it is for gay people. Sure. So if a lesbian, if they say a lesbian marries a man, nobody will really, it's not breaking news. But if everyone hears that, oh, this gay guy married a woman, it will be, that's what everybody be talking about and all. And, you know, you find that 
the homophobia isn't even equal in terms of how we approach like both sides and just even the grace that we give um you know queer people in trying to navigate in in just like Nigeria you know as a whole but I think for me my own is just try to minimize harm on all sides but you know what you said about people choosing and and I find that that's what what happens a lot with people who um are out and proud you find that a lot of them lose their family it always ends up being a chosen family conversation because they don't have enough safety a lot of people um they get thrown out they're always needing extra financial assistance because you know there are some people who once they start dressing how they want to dress who's going to hire them so they already have that like extra loss financially because they're not accepted at home nobody wants to support them and then obviously even in terms of like finding jobs as well you find you find people who end up having to switch okay when i'm going to my day job i wear this then yeah Yeah. then when they go home then they change or they go in their spaces and dress or show up how they yeah i agree and when you said like um homophobia is kind of more prevalent among with towards gay people than lesbians i was like yeah yeah but i think it's more like the the, or bisexual women? Or, yeah, or bisexual women. But it's more of the, like, lesbians are fetishized, mm-hmm. you know? So it plays into their fantasies. It's not like yeah. they're not... Um, the homophobia is not, like, directed towards them. That's why, like, you ex- you see masculine presenting women experiencing a lot of violence because, like, it's not playing into yeah. their fantasy. No, definitely, yeah, definitely. And then there are a lot of stories around like men saying it's because you have not gotten yeah, the right, right dick, dick or mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. and I feel like they call it, I think they call it like lesbian infantilization where it's just like your sexuality is not serious enough for yeah. me to consider it mm-hmm. valid because mm-hmm. like I'm either fetishizing you mm-hmm. or it's just like when the right man comes mm-hmm. then you would know yeah. what what you really are because yeah. like your true sexuality is not enough but it's crazy yeah no but I've, you're, no, you're definitely right Um, and I I think that that's actually why people don't take you know lesbian seriously because one you first you have men saying mm, I feel like all women are even secretly gay yeah yes. and it's like no. also straight women I kind of give them side eyes too because they too they kind of play into this story of have you you know where they sexualize women too but then they are looking for their main partner so it, mm-hmm. I will see it a lot on Twitter it's like when they're talking about the orgasm gap mm-hmm. they're like ah but if you find a woman that is blah 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 and it's like come on sex toy yeah you know? right <laughs> they've shown women to their own vibrators yeah and... that that I think I had an episode called um um bisexual for sex heteroromantic for love yeah Boom. so that's what happens a lot and, and it's still that whole it still plays into just one not taking lesbianism seriously. You know, everybody thinks it's like a phase or it's something fun that, you know, people just do. And it's like, it's also the patriarchy where you also have people who are highly likely full-blown lesbians, but they'll be married to men, but they're saying, yeah, I'm married to a man. I sleep with my husband maybe once a month, but he allows me to have, you know, True. sexual partners. See? And so it's like, you're sleeping with women... Ten, Ten times, times more than you're sleeping <laughs> with your husband, but yeah, yeah, straight. Some wouldn't even say they're bisexual. They'll just say no. Yeah, I'm, of course I'm straight, but yes, you know I like women, and then um, obviously that whole fetish- fetishization thing is what allows a lot of men have their wives or their partners have partners because you feel like yeah, it's just another set of extra set of mm-hmm. titties, you know, True. more you one know, double policy. exactly two exactly yeah, one penis policies like extra vagina for me to play with and stuff and they don't feel threatened although you find some who are like if I'm not there you know no no go I always want to be there every single time you sleep with a woman must be three some but so they made it about him they, not necessarily about the it's woman's not, sexuality yeah, no it's not about the woman's sexuality a lot of time how many people actually care about the other person's sexuality mm-hmm. most times people just want to do what they are okay with or what satisfies them and no one is thinking oh you know my partner also has their own sex life that they need to explore and I should allow them to do that so everybody's mm-hmm. just like ah me, I'm not okay with that one. No, you must. If it's an, it's, it's why. How many times have I said, FFM threesome? Once, in fact, if you tell a man, oh, let's have a threesome, he's already imagining a woman. It's like no, I can't see between me. I, I mean the other one. And some, the fact that they even call it, some people even call it devil's threesome. Why? Yes. Why is it called the devil's threesome? But then, well, two horns. <laughs> I'm happy for them. <laughs> 
Oh, honestly, but it's it's uh, it's actually it's very interesting, and and it's so funny because I, what what was that tweet I saw about how they said um Peter B has a gay son, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tinubu has a queer daughter, mm-hmm. and so it's like I don't know why I keep saying why we like pretending. I feel like that's the whole premise of this podcast. Why do we like pretending so much in? this country you know everybody keeps you know tying down to morals and i'm religion and i get to because religion really does have a stronghold and i know that that's going to be my biggest the biggest thing i'll battle dealing with sex therapy clients because so much of what they believe is right or correct is tied to what religion has told them is right but even then it's it's not even the religion itself but more of the interpretations of what people think religion is and how they choose to what okay pastor has said or has entered popular consciousness because if you're really following religion you won't be giving head you will not be doing doggy you will not be doing you just be doing your missionary and you'll go home but you know and that's why i always say when it comes to sex like everybody's Moral compass stops at a different level. True. If you ask ten people, say almost ten for you. Yeah. <laughs> if you ask almost ten people the same question, everybody will give you a different answer. But you just find that everyone's line of okay, this is okay until here, and then they now start to feel guilt. You know, is is um is different. But how do you how do you help clients navigate their desires versus religion and their beliefs? I think it's a journey. Um, I don't want to like information dump on them, Mm -hmm. but there's a huge role that psychoeducation plays in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask questions back and forth, explore certain things in their background, and then um, just introduce the concept and say like, what do you think about your relationship to this um, issue? And then they would now kind of either tie in their experience to it or say oh no I, I can't relate to it and that's fine because like it, if you've learned about or if you've been told one thing for 10 20 30 years and this therapist is coming to tell you that oh that mindset might be a bit harmful it's okay to experience a bit of resistance mm-hmm. so that's where like reading you know extra um articles, studies, and so on. That's where, like, it comes in so that they, too, they feel empowered in the information that they are taking in and then they can either choose to take it in and then apply it or, like, pace themselves a bit. But there's definitely a a big role that psychoeducation plays there over time where I'll say, like, "This this, this is what it's called. This is how it has been shown to affect people in research and so on. This is probably, like, a trend I've seen with other clients so that that isolation is removed from them yeah. and they're not like oh I'm the only, only one, one in the world yes and also like this. yes exactly and also even tied to like, if there's a DSM word for it or s- something specific attached to it then yes so that way they're educated on their experience and I find that when you help a client name what they're experiencing it reduces the level of distress that mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're feeling because yeah. it's just like I'm not an alien and I'm yeah. not crazy and I'm mm-hmm. not a sinner and I'm not yeah. any of these labels yeah. so that's how we go yeah that's amazing thank you so much yeah i think i think naming things is and this is why you know dialing back to when people say ah which one is um which one is ace which one is this which is it's like when you name something you help people feel less isolated you Mm -hmm. help people feel like oh i'm not alone i'm not crazy Mm -hmm. there i have a community of people who also feel you know this way and that's just really what our experiences on earth are like it's like all of us, yes, as a collective, you know, we have many shared experiences. But within those shared experiences, everyone is at a different level and a different spectrum. And we also move. Some people will never move. Some people decide to move. And um and yeah, it's really okay to experience life how you feel how you how you how you see best or how you feel is the best way for you. I just I just I don't know why we're so hell bent on this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And you know, the, 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 the ironic part about all of that is we want to present that way, but it's not what people are doing. Mm-hmm. People will, they will have all sorts of sexual experiences, come on the internet and shame people for, you know, something else. Funny enough, this just makes me remember the open marriage um, episode. I don't know. Like, I didn't expect that episode to take off the way it did in terms of, like, the reactions and the shares. It's like 200 shares in, like, two days and nice. all of that stuff. Yeah, and it's, like, on the, on the reels. And it's, like, we know that. It's so funny how people will be... People will, only, will openly cheat. 
they will sleep with married people. They will do all sorts of stuff. But if you say, okay, if someone comes out to say, you know what, I don't think that I, I'm happy being with one person. My partner is also not happy being with one person. And we want to do what we want to do. People will start fighting against this. And I think that, that that's what wears me out about like human beings. It's like, if something is not for you, why do you feel the need to fight it? Mm-hmm. You know, if it's not triggering you in some way, why are you fighting against this? Like, it's like, I want the moral fabric of society to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. Our ancestors did not do this, this, yeah. that, the third. And it's like, what are you talking about? Because if we sit down and analyze your own behavior, you're not exactly the helm of morality, <laughs> morality that you are trying to push forward. And then I, th- I think that for some people, you find that a lot of them are also dealing with shame within themselves sure. because with a lot of the things that they do, they think that is wrong. So it's just like, yes, I'm doing it, but it's bad. So if this person is doing it, they shouldn't be doing it outwardly. Like there should be shame attached. And like shame is our biggest. And it's so funny because Nigerians have the most shame, but we're also the most shameless yes, people. Yes, yes. It's an interesting conversation. This, it's it's yes. such, this country honestly just makes my mind just mm-hmm. explode all the time because it's like where you should have shame, where you should have common decency for like treating human beings, all of that. That's where your bad behavior is. Then the other place where you should be, where you should, we should carry that arrogance and expressiveness and, you know, into those spaces, making places healthy for people, defending each other and stuff. We're just... Yeah. <sighs> compulsory, compulsory monogamy will be like I said will be the depth of you know the typical Christian marriage um structure and I feel like that affects a lot of things than we realize. Um it affects like children reproducing, our ability to buy for home to buy homes and our dear our idea of family. So it's like if we allow for like an open marriage situation, what does that say about like the structure of a family? What does that say about the structure of the society in general? And we we also terrible at establishing like common humanity to say like me and you, we are human and we experience human experiences, human urges. I bleed, you bleed. We want to see ourselves as elevated and different and so on. And we don't celebrate like human autonomy where we are celebrating our differences. So like you said, where we should emphasize differences and uniqueness and so on, we don't. And where we should emphasize like you know, communality, togetherness, as and, and so on. We also don't. So it's 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 a very weird dynamic that we live in. You no, know, it it really is. It really is. It's like it's like, why do we? And and it's so funny because even within Muslim spaces as well. And it's so because even growing up, I used to say like, oh yeah, even if I get married, if my husband, mind you, I grew up Muslim, if my husband marries another, if I'm gone. So, so all of us still have that. And it's so it, outside of religion, because it has spilled into like media, it has spilled into popular consciousness. It's like when you read all the romantic novels and the movies and oh, my home, happily ever after. Everybody wants to find their Prince Charming or, you know, their, their life partner, their Cinderella story and all. And so it's not just like you find a lot of younger Muslims are not trying to have multiple partners. Like nobody, you, you even people that grew up in polygamous homes, they're cr- cons- um, constantly pushing past polygamy because because of the dynamics that you know mm-hmm. they had to face mm-hmm. with um finances with the fighting yeah. with the strange relationships with their family members and all because me i mean I, I have a brother and like because me and my sibling are super close i always used to assume that everybody was close with their siblings i think that you know i'll ask someone oh, when last you talk to your brother mm, six months ago how <laughs> how is this person your blood and you guys are not even close but obviously understanding that you know family dynamics are different that's one thing that you you come to learn you know as an adult in the world for so many different reasons family does not necessarily look like what we think Mm -hmm. it looks like it's not always going to be blood it's like your chosen family it's like you know who you decide to build a life with you guys say okay we're going to do this together experiencing each other giving each other the space to still be but also having that um that togetherness, you know, I I I I think that is extremely, is extremely important. And then even more so now with the way the country is scattered, Jackpot, you know, you're close to someone today, tomorrow they've gone to another country. Um, you know, the economy self does not even like honestly. I feel like we're just <laughs> somebody like that. Like that tweet. I mean, I don't die and Nigeria is hell because I don't know. 
I don't know what's going on right now. But um, but yeah, but it's nice. It's amazing that you know you're this um space that people can reach out to. I definitely like like I like I said even before. I think you're one you're one therapist whose name has come up to me like a lot when people are you know because I always ask for recommendations, but I always want to know people that people have worked with. And you're one therapist that has come up um very whose name has come up a lot. I didn't even know that you were even this like versed in sexuality. Um, like this and that's amazing I definitely will be sending more people <laughs> I definitely will be sending more people your way I love that I love that because honestly we need more spaces where people can just be them so like, just live because this country is already one hand on your neck and then you know just who you're trying to be being that extra hand is just not what we need so thank you, thank you so much where can people find you Um, you can find me on social media Instagram is us therapy that is us therapy Instagram and TikTok and my website is ustherapy.org. So, yes, um, you know, you heard her. Find her at Us Therapy. Please leave my leave my names. I'm not ready to take clients, but I know it's definitely taking clients right now. And um, she comes highly recommended. If she does anything, you don't know, like reports to me because me, that's another thing. When I give recommendations, and, and that's that's one huge thing that also happens in this country where many people have had bad experiences with therapists. So I find that a lot of people would rather use people abroad you know, use African-American therapists or use, like, those apps, better help. I mean, those apps are good, but I feel like having somebody who is close by and can also understand the cultural context of this country is very important. So thank you again so much for coming and thank you for the work that you do. Fine. <clears throat> give me. Find me. <laughs> Find me at House of Chocolates. Find the podcast at Spizz or Swallow Pod on Instagram. Uh, TikTok, Spizzle Swallow Podcast on YouTube, SOS Pod Official on Twitter. And I'll see you guys same time, maybe next week, maybe next year. <laughs> Bye.